pop up on your screen and just go ahead and click accept. All right, thank you. And yes, si se puede, si se puede. Okay, Berta, I'll pass it over to you. Well, thank you, um, Mr. Valdez, for reminding us that our heritage is, heritage is what gives us nutrition and power. Um, for reminding us that um, this movement is, movement is going to outlive us and that without the farm workers, none of us can eat. Um, so while we wait for questions to come in, I would like to start, um, you know, the summer's coming. And in recent years, uh, record high temperatures have been seen across the country. Um, the summer of 2020 set new heat records throughout the nation for both high temperatures and number of days at extreme high temperatures including the hottest temperatures on the planet in more than a century. Farm workers are still fighting to get national heat regulation bill approved. What can we do to support our farm workers community as we see more of the effects of the climate change? Are you asking me? Yes. Directly? <laughs> <laughs> what can we do? Well, I mean, that's a big one. That's certainly, uh, the idea is that though is that this has to be out there so that people can see it. You know, there has to be documentation of there is, of course, as as to what's happening. It has to get to the right people in the right places. It uh, that means Congress. You know, we have to pressure the people in Washington to provide these. Uh, you can start at the state level, actually, in Sacramento to begin with. That's probably more practical. But but uh, eventually, it has to go to the federal level to provide uh, worker protections that others have. Now, it, 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 we saw during the corona, uh, the pandemic, that uh, the meat workers you know, in chicken and, and beef plants across the Midwest were not protected in any way. And, and their corporations uh, were quite willing to see their workers die. Uh, so uh, that's because they also happen to be immigrant labor, a lot of them from Mexico that are just spreading into the Midwest and working in these fields, working in the meat plants at the way they've been working in the fields. It, it requires a tremendous shift of consciousness here. That requires direct activism. There have to be ways that we can pressure the politicians to introduce the laws that we need. Now, in terms of the heat, I don't know what we're going to do. We can't do anything to change the sun. The sun is already doing what it's going to do. And global warming is a fact uh, it probably means changing the work hours to begin with. You've seen that come campesinos start really early, way before sunrise. You know, I've seen, I live in, uh, San Juan Bautista still has fields all around. So we're in touch with, uh, with the workers that are going out there in the middle of the night, you know, starting to work at 4 a.m. with lights. Uh, th that happens as a result of, of the temperature changes. But uh, how to deal directly with heat stroke uh, there have to be medical attention that's there for workers. There have to be decisions that are made uh, with respect to how to get the crews out there. If the decision is left up to labor contractors, nothing will happen. It has to be ingrained into the system by law that just as you wouldn't endanger uh, workers in a steel plant from burning to death, uh, you, you, we can't allow campesinos to, to burn to death in the fields. Um, I would like to tell the audience, if you have a question, please raise your hand or type it in the chat. Uh, feel free to ask any questions. So my second question, um, many of the actos and plays uh, you wrote um, highlighted much of the inequalities and races that existed during the farm workers um, and in the mid 1960s. Um, do you feel that some of those works are relevant today? Unfortunately, everything is relevant, you know, everything that the teatro has done for the last 57 years is still relevant. And we prove it by performing, you know, an old acto and, and it still works, you know, it, it, uh, it works in the sense that the audiences received them, you know, with, with, with the impact that they had at the beginning. The fact is that social consciousness uh, is something that has to be passed from generation to generation. And uh, the early actors uh, helped to activate our young generation at the time. That young generation is not so young anymore. You know, they're, they're grandfathers and grandmothers now. They're, 
they're on their way out, so to speak. But what inspired them when they saw the actors can still inspire them in in the uh, in the theaters today or out in the community centers. Regard, you know, the one thing that uh, I think is really important is that we develop cultural centers that are close to the communities that people live in and perform for those communities. If if television, you know, it's, if you're gonna wait for Netflix and uh, Amazon to get the right kind of material out there, you're gonna have to wait a while because it's, it's, it's gonna happen, but it's not gonna happen for a while. The teatro is immediate, you know, it's right there. It's instantly at hand. And we used to talk about actos and, and tacos, you know, they have that immediacy, actos and tacos. It, it's, and so uh, the acto was there for people to eat it right away. It's hot, it's ready, it's tasty, use it, you know? And so uh, teatro as a weapon is something that can, uh, that can help to keep consciousness alive. So thank you. There's a question in the chat from Nicholas. Uh, what is the current state of far Farmers unions and co-workers own farms. How does this compare to the mid and late 1900s? Have they decayed as many other worker unions have? I'm not so sure what the question is. Let's see, it, it, it it's, uh, it's, what is the current state of farmers unions? That's the first question. Ah, well, you know, ironically, again, the Grangers, you know, the Grange were, were the small farmers. Uh, ironically, uh, when I was in high school, and, I was, and we're talking the 50s here, so it's quite a while ago, uh, I had an older brother who had a speech called The Constitution and I, and it was very popular and, and in school, and, and I had my act. I was a ventriloquist then, but there was a couple that were Grangers, and what they did is they, they, they booked us both in these Grange meetings. So we went around Northern California in Watsonville, Gilroy, uh, uh, is Hollister and different places um, visiting uh, these Grange organizations, which were the leftovers of the farmers unions of the 19th century. And, you know, they were tremendously liberal, which is really weird because today, I mean, farmers and growers are considered to be, you know, for the most part, conservative Republicans, you know, but these old Grangers uh, took us in and we were able to perform uh, for these old white people um, with a tremendous amount of honesty and, 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 and uh, you know, it was just a clarity. And so what's happened is that agriculture has changed from these small independent farmers into a corporate business. It's been happening for a hundred years, there's nothing new. And so with corporations running the fields, uh, there, there, there is less attention that's paid to um, the presence of racism, to outright injustice, you know, it, it, incompetent, uh, corrupt farm labor contractors that take advantage of the workers, you know, because they're immigrants. Uh, all of that has changed. That didn't used to be the way the agriculture was in California. It, it changed because the farm, the small farmer, was aced out. And so uh, that's the Jeffersonian ideal, you know, that, that America was supposed to be a, a country of small farmers. But the fact is that the small farmers that we need now are, are Latinos. You know, we need campesinos to take control of the land, as I was saying earlier. And, and I think that if, if, if granjeros de las granjas, you know, could come together in some kind of union uh, in the future, that would be tremendous. But at, at this point, it's a pipe dream, you know. A few growers, like I mentioned, up in Sonoma County, working in the in in the vines and their vintners, uh, but their future remains to be determined as to where they go. So there's another question in the chat from Martina Bernal. As a young organizer, what materials slash resources do you recommend looking into? You know, le learn your history. I I I'm a big believer in knowing what before because that helps to explain why things are as they are today. And a lot of it has to do with economic uh, uh, forces at work, uh, it, the systems of transportation, you know, the railroads to begin with, now the truckers and, and, and the, the highways and, and the airports, all of that 
uh, keep trade going, it filters down to the idea that it's your individual farm worker stooping over in the fields, but he's working as part of a whole system that is global. And uh, as I mentioned, if, if Ukraine and, 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 the, and the Russian grain crop go down because of the war, the whole world, and there are parts of the world that will begin to starve because they won't be able to get the wheat that they need. Now, it's important to understand what those connections are, you know, because we live in a global world and, and we, the, we see the price of gas going up, we see the price of food growing up. That's because we're all living in the same globe. Now more than ever, tu eres mi otro yo is, is functional. It is part of our daily life. And so it is important that, that people can make these connections for themselves so that you can see where the weak points are that can affect change, that we can create change. And uh, it's important to understand the whole picture and then to bring it down so that you can focus on particular points and, and, and uh, problems. So um, I have another question. Um, what are some of the current works that um, El Teatro Campesino is addressing, like social justice issues impacting communities of color? Like what are, what are the current, how is Teatro doing right now? Teatro Campesino, what works are they working on? Well, because of the pandemic, of course, we had to go online, right? I mean, we had to go into a different framework and we're continuing, you know, our Christmas plays through the online, but the social issues still have to do with, you know, the same basic fundamental issue. Uh, and and uh, we're doing it through actos, but these are actos that are not video actos, you know, that we put out there. And uh, the issues remain the same. Uh, we, we have to be sure that our educational system speaks the truth and doesn't distort our history. We've been accused of, of revising, of being historical revisionists, you know, by trying to include um, Chicanos and our people in, 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 into the history of California and the United States. Uh, it's the same argument that we're seeing in, in the airwaves over the critical race theory. You know, I think that we have to find some way to get the major population in the United States to become aware of the thrust of human of, of U.S. history, where it has come from, what it has been about. That's a struggle. So El Teatro Gamacino continues to devote itself to these themes through, through new plays. Uh, we, we're also working uh, in media. You know, I wrote a play called uh, Valley of the Heart, which had to do with, uh, it's based in World War II, but it's a love story between the, the daughter of a, of a Nisei, of a, Japanese American farmer, she was a Nisei, first, second generation, and a Mexican American sharecropper. You know, they fall in love. And it's Valley of the Heart. We started in San Juan Bautista in, in 2013, performed it in our theater, and then in Monterey and in San Jose, and eventually to, San, to Los Angeles. And that is now a screenplay. And uh, we're working on getting it done to getting it done as a film. Uh, Again, it's, you, you can only do so much with the only 24 hours in a day is only so much that you can do. So you have to pick your struggles as they go. We have learned long ago that if you can get a movie done, that movie will survive for quite a while and that will circulate worldwide. And a play has the virtue of immediacy. So we still do that. We still live the idea of live performance and the the development of live talent, I think, is absolutely critical, uh, particularly for new generations that have not been exposed yet. But uh, uh, we are planning to go back online, to go back, not online, uh, to go back into live production this coming summer, the summer of 2022. We won't be back to full bore, though, until 2023. Hopefully, this new variant you know, of the coronavirus will not affect us all because we're anxious to get back on the road. We're anxious to get back in our community. We've lost a few people, notably the Maestro Noe Montoya, you know, who was a 50 year member of the Maestro uh, in here in San Juan Bautista, who knew all our songs. He was like a bank of all our Huelga songs and, and your Maestro in terms of indigenous musicology. He had instruments that he collected that were incredible. And, and unfortunately, he was one of the first victims of, of the pandemic. You know, he, he was out there performing for campesinos and he caught the virus and got a bad cough. And bef before we knew it, uh, he was gone. And uh, 
we miss him, of course, and and Andres Gutierrez, who was our first general manager, uh, although he had retired, uh, also died to coronavirus. Uh, Diane Rodriguez, who who was one of our our alumni, so to speak, you know, she had become the the associate artistic director of the Center Theater Group in Los Angeles. Uh, died of cancer, uh, not of the virus, but. Any case, we're at a gener where the old generation is now facing the inevitable end of their lives. It really puts a, a, a emphasis then on the need to develop new talent, new generations. And I personally encourage any of you, if you have any inkling or love of the arts of any kind, painting, singing, dancing, doing teatro, writing poetry, writing stories, I say do it not just for yourself, because although that's enriching, but do it for your people, do it for your community, do it for your world, sing from the heart and speak from the truth. So another question from um, the chat from uh, Ethnic Studies Professor Cuemponca Sandoval. Thank you for all the work you have dedicated. Thank you for all the work you have dedicated to social justice, Maestro. How might you see campesinos and teatro campesino align with and center California native tribal struggles and issues? Well, of course, you know, ultimately uh, we're heavily Indio, you know, we're all, we're all indigenous, you know, down deep inside you, you check our DNA, you know, for the most part we're there, you know, it, it, we're one people. And, and I think the idea that we have a legacy of, 10 to 15,000 years of cultural presence and, and, and civilization to share with all our indigenous cousins and brothers and sisters, I think is absolutely essential. I've always find, found it a little strange that there's this distinction between American Indians, you know, and Mexican Indians. They're, they're all Indians, you know, it's, it's one native group. It's these native peoples and so the struggles of, of, of native uh, tribes in, in California and throughout the United States is, our, is as much our struggle as those of, in Mexico and Central America and South America. Uh, we need to acknowledge our unity as, as, as a continental uh, human presence you know, in this hemisphere. So Jenny Morales would like to know from Teatro Campesino's work, which acto is your favorite? <laughs> well, you know, that's not for me to say. It's for the people, really. <laughs> it's it's uh, the one that keeps published the most for some reason is Los Bendidos, you know. Again, that's not necessarily my favorite. It's not among my favorites. But Los Bendidos has been published in more books than, than any of the other actos. I think because it speaks to an American sensibility you know, buying and selling used Mexicans, you know. Uh, but uh, we had that since uh, Teatro created that in 1968, you know, and, and it's been on, on somebody's uh, stage ever since. But there are others among them, Dos Caras del Patroncito, you know, La Quinta Temporada, some of the early actors from the Huelga are still relevant. We can still perform them and people still find something in them. Uh, I think that, uh, and then the actors that we've done that no one's ever heard of because they were done in relation to a specific event, you know, uh, uh, we continue to do that now. I still get ideas for actos all the time because there's a language in the acto that, that it addresses things very directly. And, and also it, it, it helps you to transcend uh, the horror and, and the disgust and the anger that the world can, can present to you in, in its various forms. And uh, I think we need to make you know, we, we have to do more than make fun of Putin, but I, I, I think it helps, you know, if, if, if that guy uh, uh, can be satirized along with a lot of other people. He needs more than satire, though. That guy just needs to be gotten out of his position of power. Uh, he, he's consistent with others. Uh, I'm dismayed by, by seeing what's happened to the Republican Party. Uh, I was never fond of the Republican Party. But California used to be Republican, you know, at one point, way back when I was in high school, it was a Republican state. But uh, what's happened to the Republican power, uh, public party now, I think is an absolute human disgrace. 
and it speaks to the corruption of American, the American character. Well, it's up to us to keep that American uh, character honest and, and, and keyed on, on what values uh, are most important in life. Uh, and so uh, teatro as such uh, would love to address these if, if it weren't for the pandemic, would be out there working on, on Ted Cruz and some of these other people you know, that you see in the news. And then Sandra Ramirez is wondering what traits uh, or qualities do you believe a good organizer needs to succeed? A good organizer has to have as much perspective as possible. In other words, a good organizer needs to know uh, where they are and why they are there. Uh, it's so easy to get lost in the weeds, you know, uh, or, or get lost in the forest because of the trees. You know, the thing is that you have to remember that you're in the forest. And so an organizer goes into a strike or goes into uh, an activity, it could be a protest, uh, but has to keep the calm, has to keep the, the wider perspective, keep their sense of humor and clarity. If you give in to anger, if you get into depression, if you get into frustration, you're going to lose. Then you're not organizing anything. So you have to be slightly above it. I think that's the wonder of Dolores Huerta as an organizer. What makes her absolutely great is her spiritual strength. I've never seen her go negative. I've never seen her go depressed. Nothing can topple her. And, um, and I have seen her under violent circumstances. I was with her in the in the LA produce market when some goons came and threw her off the dock, you know, under the cement. And, and she got right back up in spite of the pain and went right back at it. I mean, it was an act of courage that I had never witnessed before. But there's this little woman facing up to these goons and she did it with power. She was able to back them up. And, and so uh, she's still that a tremendous leader and she's out there to remind us that the struggle is bigger than all of us. It's bigger than any single generation. And then Juvenal, um, do you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes. Um, so Maestro Valdez, it is an absolute honor to see you. Um, so I am assistant professor of ethnic studies here. My focus is Chicanx Latinx studies. Um, I first learned about your work to Teatro Iscali back home and when they we, and again I went to to Troiscali Escuela de la Raza and they have a theater group as you probably are as you most, I'm sure you know and so this is how I learned more about your work. Um, so I'm teaching um, three classes here at CSU Stan and um, so I have two questions because of my two classes. The first one is I'm teaching a class on community organizing and activism and we are reading um, um, Sal Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. So I wanted to ask if, if you could help my students, um, you know, if you could touch on the issues of community organizing and activism um, in relation to your work. Well, I think one of the things that we've discovered about community organizing is that you have to, you have to flow with the rhythms of the community itself. And so uh, obviously there's stuff already happening in any community in terms of day-to-day -day survival. Mothers and, and, and fathers are out there working to feed their kids and to send them to school and to keep them dressed and you know, out of the cold and so forth. Uh, these are very basic concerns. And, and so when you can't come up with an act or you come up with an idea, you know, it's, it's great to be able to include that as part of the flow. And uh, this is why a lot of the work that the teatro does, does it in terms of familias, you know, it may be, not the whole family is involved, but family members are involved. And if you get the kids, you can sometimes get the parents. Or if you get the parents, you sometimes get the kids. So you should plan for the whole event, the idea of the familia as a unit and what the needs of the familia are. Because it is that is part of the working character of our communities that, we're, we're, you know, a community is a family of families. And I've always talked about the teatro being a family of families. And so uh, obviously the needs of the family have to be respected. And if, if you can address in some way those needs, uh, the, the people involved will respect you. You know, they, they, they'll say, okay, we're all on the same side. If you go against them, if you expect the family to make sacrifices that they can't make because they got to feed their kids, then you're, you're not going to reach them, you know? And so 
this is something I picked up from Cesar, quite frankly. He was a community organizer and, and Dolores. I mean, they were great. They involved every member of the family in terms, if they could, right, in terms of what was happening. And, and uh, everything was uh, respected and embraced, you know, even if it's just sweeping the floor, cooking food, you know, all of that is important. And even with the teatro, and people still have to eat. So if somebody's willing to cook for us, we respect that, right? And they become part of, of what's happening. In terms of costumes, you know, there's all kinds of people, men and women, that can sew. And so we involve that. We get them involved just to sewing up costumes, right? And they're happy to do it. They're happy to be involved. If they have any artistic talent whatsoever, they can paint. You know, that becomes, again, we incorporate that music. It goes without saying, everybody loves music and making live music is, is one of the enriching elements of, I mean, cultural activity it enriches everybody's lives. It's a thing in itself, right? And so um, we incorporate that then. So th that's my advice it, is organize your community, but go with the grain, go with what's there. Some of that is a drag also because people are so overwhelmed with these problems, you have to help them overcome just enough so that they can become involved. A little cash sometimes helps, you know. Again, if you can pay, pay people a stipend. And five dollars a week was not hard to do, but that's one of the ways that we survived in the early days. I appreciate you answering that question. So my next question was my students also read at Blandi Delano. And, and especially the Perenigranación, when you march from Delano to Sacramento, if you, and, and they're gonna be writing their own planets pretty soon too. Any um, advice, any tips, or, or just any anything you can share on the Plan de Delano and its relevance today? The Plan de Delano? You mean the yes. plan that, that I wrote or what? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I wrote it actually at, at Cesar's behest, you know, but he, he, I took some notes and uh, I said, what do you want me to put into it? And so he gave me those notes and I put it together and it's a little inspired by uh, El Plan de Ayala, you know, the Emiliano Zapata. So some of the wording comes from that. It was patched together, you know, but, but the thing is, what was important is to give campesinos a sense of perspective that we were in Delano and, and running this great strike, but it wasn't just about Delano. It was about the farm workers in, in Modesto. It was about the farm workers in Planada. It was about the farm workers, you know, uh, it, it, all the way up and down the state, all the way into Santa Rosa and, and Marysville. And we were trying to speak for the whole valley. And that gave us, that gave the, the, the March to Sacramento a power that, that brought national attention, you know? This was happening in California, but in that way, then it was happening in the United States and it, it inspired Texas. Then it was not long after that, that Texas had their own march, right? In the South Valley. And of course, that's just as vital, just as important as the San Joaquin Valley. And, and, and so we were glad to see that, that we went national. Okay. And so this will, uh, uh, this will be our last question from Nicholas. Um, do you have thoughts on democratic ownership of businesses, um, especially with farmers? Yes, I believe that we should own as many of our businesses as we can. You know, I, I think it's a matter of knowing something about business that you can survive. I mean, this is uh, a capitalist country, so business is very important. But it's uh, the fact is that... Uh, so many of our people are, are not just wage slaves, but they're, they're slaves to the credit system. And I, I'm thinking now of my parents, God bless them, you know, they, they spent so many years of their lives uh, pagando abonos, you know what I mean? It's paying payments uh, for a house or, or payments for this, or for, even for groceries. And, and the fact is that, that that's a state of mind. If you can get out of that to the point where you can begin to profit from your own effort and your own labor, if you can make money at what you do uh, and reinvest that and to do more of what you do, then then you'll be a lot freer, you know? And I never expected uh, to make money by becoming a writer, but I never doubted that I could make a living as a writer. And, and so uh, that is part of what I do, you know? And What's amazing to me is that when we did Zoot Suit in Mexico, I did the world premiere in 2010 for the Compañía Nacional de Teatro in Mexico City. 
On the one hand, I didn't know if the Pachuco story was going to play in Mexico, uh, but uh, it, it, and then people were saying, don't expect that it's going to be as successful as it was in Los Angeles. But it turned out it was as successful as it was in Los Angeles. It's the same people. And it was voted the best Mexican musical of the year, you know? I mean, a Chicano play. But the fact is that, that I was paid for the privilege. It was through the government and I was paid. You had to get all my documents straight because I'm an American citizen. Uh, but I, I, I went there and, and I was able to work in Mexico uh, and work as an artist. Now, it wasn't a great deal of money, but it was more than you'd expect. And the fact is that uh, I, I took it because I always recycle uh, whatever comes uh, it, back into the whole process. El Teatro Campesino exists through the generosity and the help of many, many people. Many of the founding members of El Teatro Campesino still pay out of their pockets to keep the company going. Now we, we happen to charge for what we do and, and but it, it's not a great deal of profit, but you know what, we're solvent. We are in the black. We're not going to fall apart because we, we can't pay the rent since we own our own building. So that, I think that kind of liberation of the credit system is very important to the advancement of our people. We need to give prosperous enough so we can stand up with pride and with power for what we believe in. So um, there were the there was somebody that was wondering if you're going to be um, in LA soon. I was going to leave that as the last question. They're just wondering if you're going to be out in LA soon. Uh, yes, in the LA area, El Camino College, I believe. Uh, that's coming out. That's in Torrance, I think. Uh, th that will be in May or June. They should look it up. You know, it's part of the college, El Camino College. I'll also be in San Diego, UC uh, Santa Barbara coming up in April. Well, we appreciate um, all the wonderful questions and comments, Mr. Valles. Thank you for sharing your journey with us. Thank you for sharing your perspective. And before our program comes to an end, uh, we would like to wrap up our program with Jenny Morales, a Stan State alumni and activist. She will be singing the colores for us. And following that, just stick around to end with our traditional si se puede. All right. <laughs> for the opportunity. Um, this is for all the farm workers and to honor you, Senor Valdez. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Jenny, thank you for such a wonderful interpretation. So ahora sí, it's time for the que vivas. And the que vivas are just a color response. So I'm going to say que viva and then 
Que viva Cesar Chavez, you guys are gonna respond. Que viva. So are you guys ready? Feel free to unmute yourselves. Que vivan los campesinos. Que viva. Que viva, que viva Cesar Chavez. Que viva. Que viva. Que viva Dolores Huerta. Que viva. Que viva Larry Itliong. Que viva. Que viva Luis Valdez. Que viva. Que vivan los estudiantes y la comunidad. Que viva. Que vivan los Stan State students viva. fighting for social justice. Que viva. Que viva the ethnic studies department. Que viva. Que viva. Y que viva los que viva. centros de necessity. Que viva que los viva. centros de necessity. Que viva. <laughs> Okay, thank you for that. Uh, with that said, uh, on behalf of the Warrior Cross Cultural Center and the Cesar Chavez Committee at Stan State, we wanna thank our sponsors, the Norris Rocaverte Family Foundation, Mr. Luis Valdez, the facilitators of, and all of you this evening for joining us. Uh, please help us by filling out the feedback form that is in, in the chat. This will be provided by Ms. Carolina. Um, this, uh, this will help us with planning for future events. Once again, thank you and have a wonderful evening. Gracias. Gracias. Sí se puede. Se puede. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Okay.